Okay. Uh, I think everything is going well. Hopefully uh, the audio is at the right level. And uh, this is the first of uh, four little get-togethers that we're going to do uh, to talk through uh, Chapter 11 on vibrations and waves. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, vibrations. And uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about... There it is. Simple. Oh, my. One moment, please. That's a little spastic. <laughs> Simple harmonic motion. And we're going to abbreviate this as SHM. And as it turns out, anything that vibrates or wiggles back and forth, which is a ton of things in this world, um, can be broken down into a combination of a bunch of simple harmonic motion. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, this is one of my favorite topics in physics because uh, my name is in it. Um, simple harmonic motion uh, is uh, two things. First of all, it requires a linear restoring force. Um, wow, that looks like a child wrote it. It's kind of fun. Uh, <laughs> linear restoring force. So anything that wiggles back and forth has a restoring force. You move something to one side, and something tries to bring it back to the middle. You move it to the other side, it tries to bring it back to the middle, and then there's this constant overshooting of the middle, and that's where the wiggling comes from. Um, a linear restoring force is a well-behaved restoring force, and when that happens, uh, then we're uh, on, a, on a par to describe these signs, these things with sign and cosine. Um, that just means that they move in that nice uh, sinusoidal, oops, that didn't work, evenly connected, back and forth kind of motion that math teachers are excessively good at drawing and physics teachers are not. So sine and cosine um, will describe these things. So um, the first thing, the first system we're going to talk about that to give us an example of this uh, is the uh, example it's going to be the mass and spring system. And this is like the classic uh, uh, example. It's easy to think about uh, in the AP classes. It's very easy to do the, the calculations required to generate the equation to figure out what the solutions are going to be. And everything else can be compared to the mass and spring and say, how much like the mass and spring is it? So what is a mass and spring system? Well, what we need for a mass and spring system is we need a rigid wall on one side. And we need some sort of ground or floor or whatever. And this needs to be frictionless. So I'm going to say mu equals 0. That's our physics code way of saying that there is no friction. Um, and um, we're going to put a mass. And I'm going to draw it as a square block because we physicists love square blocks. And I'll put the letter m in the square block. This mass needs to sit on this frictionless floor and needs to be connected to the wall with a spring, which I'm going to draw as kind of a curly Q here. And that spring is characterized by a spring constant K. <laughs> so the first thing we need to say is that the force from a spring um, is going to be K times X. And K is the spring constant. And x is the amount of the stretch. Ooh, I'm doing that child writing thing again. 
Um, spring constant uh, is a big number for springs that are very stiff and hard to move, like your garage door springs um, or the springs at the park underneath that little uh, duck and chicken that kids sit on and wiggle back and forth. Um, and spring constant is very low for springs that are easy to move, so maybe like a rubber band or um, the spring in a ballpoint pen that you click, it's very easy to move those, so spring constant would be small. Spring constant is measured, oh, there we go, in units of newtons per meter. And that makes sense because we're going to get newtons of force out of this spring for every meter that you stretch it. And agreed, some springs don't stretch a full meter, but any fraction of a meter is still going to work. The stretch will be measured in meters since it is a distance. And the key here is that it is measured away from some sort of equilibrium position. So I'm going to draw a line underneath here, and I'm going to say, oh, that's our equilibrium position. And so this is our system. One more thing, one more point of, uh, of uh, uh, fine stuff. Uh, most people will say that the force on a mass spring system is minus kx, meaning the force is going to be in the opposite direction of the x. Uh, if I was to pull this mass out this way, uh, the force which I will uh, show in red here, uh, would be back this way. So this is the force, and this guy is the displacement. Uh, in my way of thinking, uh, we just remember that that is the case, that it is a restoring force, and that this is the uh, amount of it. So we can think about placing uh, the, uh, what are those things called? You know, something. This is bars, yes. Alrighty, so uh, I need to figure out how to get the next page going here, so give me a second. Uh, hit this button here, and we move to page two. Look at that. That is nice. So here's the key. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to draw four of these mass and spring systems. One here, one here, one here, and one over here. i gotta, I got to tell you, this is uh, not easy. I'm out of practice. There was a way I used to hold this thing. And here's going to be zero. I know this is laborious. But hey, that's the only reason this thing's going to take a while. Now, if I get these things posted on YouTube, which is my goal, um, you can watch them at any speed you want. Um, so here's the deal. We're going to start by pulling the mass to the side, uh, the way I indicated before. And uh, it's going to go out to a position I'm going to call capital A for reasons that will be clear later. That means that the spring is going to be stretched a lot. So what happens when you let go of uh, this particular thing? Well, it begins to move into this drawing right here, which is where the mass has been pulled back to its resting equilibrium position by the spring. But unfortunately, at this point, it is moving, and I'm going to put some little lines behind it to indicate that this mass is moving. That means it's going to overshoot its position, and it's going to go over to this drawing over here, where it is going to pass by the origin, and it's going to move in to where it compresses the spring. Now, as it compresses the spring, the spring is going to fight it and eventually drag it to a stop, and that will occur, amazingly enough, at a position of minus A on the number line. And that's why a linear restoring force is, is uh, absolutely necessary so that this thing will be nice and symmetrical. So now we've compressed the spring and the mass has finally come to a stop. And so, of course, the spring is going to try to push the mass back to its equilibrium position. So I'm going to draw that right here. And there's the spring attached to the back side. But now, of course, it's also moving and it's going to overshoot. And guess what? it goes back to position A. So absent any friction, this is a cycle that repeats over and over and over again. Uh, if there is friction, it's not hard to imagine what's going to happen, that the cycle will repeat, but it won't go quite as far as A or minus A. Each time it will go a little less, and that's called a damped oscillation. Here we're just going to spend some time talking about pure oscillations. This is the mass spring system. Now, there is something very interesting uh, that's going on here that I think it's worth uh, uh, talking about, and that is what's going on with the energy. In this case, this guy here has entirely potential energy. He's not moving, but he has stretched a spring, so there's some potential energy associated with the spring. In case you care, uh, the potential energy associated with a spring is one-half 
of that spring constant times how far it's been stretched squared. Um, we've seen this, this kind of thing before, one half of something times something else squared. In fact, it was hidden inside of our Swiss Army equation. And when you see things like that, um, you know you're looking at something that has to do with calculus. So if any of you take calculus class, this will be an important part of your day. Um, after we uh, the spring brings it back to its equilibrium position, it has no longer has a stretched spring, so it does not have potential energy. But this thing has kinetic energy because it is moving really fast. Then, of course, it uses that kinetic energy to compress the spring, and this will have the same potential energy that it had before. And that potential energy will turn back into kinetic energy in this drawing. So. One of the easiest ways to do calculations about a mass and spring system is to look at the energy that's at true at any moment. And that includes moments that are between these drawings. I've just drawn these four cardinal points of the cycle. But certainly if we were somewhere over here where we were a mixture of potential and kinetic energy, um, we could figure out how to draw what the system looked like in that situation. That might be a little fun. Um, Let's do that. Let's go ahead and draw what the system would look like if it was over here. And uh, I'm going to draw it down here at the bottom. Uh, that would probably have the mass somewhere between the origin and point A. Oh, point A just disappeared. There it is. So the mass might be in here somewhere. Um, and the spring would be not quite as stretched as it was in the first drawing. But the mass would be moving, but maybe not quite as fast as it was in the first drawing. So this is a situation that represents a mixture of potential and kinetic energy. If you could just imagine in your head uh, this thing going back and forth, um, that would be fun. Um, j just for uh, you know entertainment uh, principles here, uh, <laughs> uh, there was a student of mine who, when I characterize these things vibrating back and forth as being going boingy boingy. He uh, he remembered that there was a band, and it's actually a band I like a lot from the 80s called Oingo Boingo, but he typed it in wrong, and he found a thing called the Boingy, boingy Rock Band. And Boingy Boingy Rock Band is a band where they took the drum set and they welded it together. So there's a bass drum and a snare and you know, maybe another tom over here, and then there's some cymbals sitting around. And they welded this all together, including the seat that the drummer sits on, and they built a frame. And they suspended the entire drum set from springs. I actually think there might have been some cymbals that were mounted to the edge here uh, and that you could hit if you reached out and reached towards the frame. And the drummer would play, and the drummer would bounce up and down and side to side while he played. And if, if that's your shtick, if that's what gets you the gigs, then <laughs> good luck to you. But you might have some fun looking at the, the boingy, boingy rock band. But I would recommend just actually looking up uh, Oingo Boingo. Okay, so... um. So what's the motion going to look like? What is what is the displacement of this 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 mass as a function of time going to look like? And and uh, uh, we did say that it was going to be sines and cosines. So we could actually make a drawing here of a graph, and this is going to be time along this axis, and this is going to be distance away from the origin. And this thing starts some distance a away from the origin, then it returns to the origin, then of course it overshoots. And then it returns to the origin, and then it overshoots. And you can see we're going to get this really nice sine wave. Um, if you want to look at the velocity as a function of time, uh, that's actually going to be, oh, I said sine wave. But you know what? That really is a cosine type wave because it starts with some position. But the velocity of the mass uh, is going to start with some amount. And then it's going to actually turn negative first. And then it's going to go to 0. And then it's going to turn positive, and then it's going to go to zero. So we actually wind up with some sort of negative sine curve. Um, furthermore, the acceleration. OK, now the acceleration, the easiest way to think about that is either how much is the uh, velocity changing, or the acceleration due to Newton's second law is tied directly to the force. So when is the spring maximally um, stretched or compressed, and it starts maximally stretched in a way that it's going to bring the mass towards zero. So that's a negative acceleration. And then what we're going to wind up with is this kind of thing. We're going to wind up with a negative cosine curve. 
So these curves are all related to each other, and you should think through, maybe with the guidance of your book, um, where are the position, velocity, and acceleration going to be uh, maximums or minimums? You know, I'm going to have to work on um, on this. I may actually pre-draw these things. I don't know. Maybe it's more fun to draw them for you, and then you get to see the stuff being created, even though it does look like a child with a crayon. Uh, it is toes drew this stuff. But anyway, moving on. Um, so you can uh, characterize simple harmonic motion, the mass and spring system in particular, uh, by talking about a couple different things. First of all, you can talk about the spatial thing, and that is the amplitude. What is the maximum amount of displacement away from the origin? And that's why I use the letter A for how far we pulled that mass to the side, because A stands for amplitude. So the amplitude will tell you the maximum x, and that tells you how far or how tall the sine and cosine curves would be. Another thing you could talk about is the period of time it takes. And the period of time is the amount of time for one cycle. You know, my writing is getting better. I'm learning how to use this tablet. You should see this thing I got here. This is a old school uh, draw on the tablet kind of deal. And uh, a little pen with a battery in it. I'm excited. And I set up my laptop so I can do this anywhere, not just my, my dirty den office area here. Trust me, there was no earthquake. We just uh, had a moment looking for something the other day and tore this room apart. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, uh, the period for a simple uh, harmonic motion oscillator or, uh, or a mass spring system is abbreviated with a special letter T. It's a capital T. That's a specific time, the time for one cycle, one motion. And in the case of the simple harmonic oscillator, uh, the period is 2 pi, because we're doing 2 pi radians around a circle, an imaginary circle of, uh, of phases that the thing can be in. And... Um, it is 2 pi times the square root of m divided by k. So when you're trying to figure out the period of the motion, um, the mass of the, ma the, the mass of the mass, here you go, the mass of the block, uh, the heavier that is, the, the more it's going to slow the thing down, the longer the time is going to be. So that's why it's on the top. And so I call this the inertial term. And then on the bottom is the spring constant, and um, that uh, is telling us how stiff the spring is, how hard it is to move, how, how much it wants the mass to return to its original position. Um, so we could call this the force term. And so this is just a, basically a fight between the force of a spring and the inertia of mass as you tweak it. There is one more word I want to throw out there at you, and um, that is the word frequency. And I kind of said this in class before we... Stop school. Frequency. Um, I use this term when I was talking about the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, um, frequency is kind of like the inverse of period. Uh, not, no, it's not kind of like the inverse of period. Um, it is the inverse of period. So frequency is abbreviated with the letter F, and it is equal to the inverse of the period. And we tend to use frequency when things are happening very fast, when the period is much less than one second. Instead of saying how many seconds for one cycle, we tend to say how many cycles in one second. So this is measured in cycles per second, which is abbreviated with... Uh, uh, gentleman's name, HZ, which stands for Hertz. Um, this is the unit that's used in radio frequency. So if you enjoy Jack FM 93.1, that's actually 93.1 million hertz, megahertz, millions of cycles per second. So you can see it would be uncomfortable to talk about the period of time because um, uh, it would be such a short period of time, but it is easier to talk about how many millions of cycles per second. Uh, AM radio tends to be in the kilohertz range and um, FM in the megahertz range. And uh, your microwave oven is in the gigahertz range. Uh, you may have heard these uh, words thrown about when people are talking about Wi-Fi as well. Uh, you know, I have a Wi-Fi unit right here, and um, it's putting out a 2.4 gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi signal, but it also puts out a 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi. 
one. Well, why, why would that one be better? Well, the higher frequency can actually carry more information. So there you go. Um, I think this is a good place to stop. Um, these are these are definite uh, vocabulary words that we should uh, look into: amplitude, period, frequency. Um, going back on the slides here, uh, we should know that our our motion looks like a, a cosine or sine curve of some type, and it's logical where it starts and um, that kind of thing. By the way, on this graph, one period would be right there, one full cosine or one full sine. Uh, this one's a little harder. It's over here because I was not in proportion. Uh, and then going back uh, for review here, where's my slide? It's coming up. Uh, we definitely have the concept of a, of a cycle, and we have these drawings of what the uh, what's going on as we move around in time around this circle. Um, and you should know when there is potential or kinetic energy in the system. And then finally, definish, definitionally, Absolute value bars. That was the word I was fishing for. That's a great moment. Um, you should know that vibration is usually simple harmonic motion, and that requires a linear restoring force. Okay, that's enough for now. I'm going to work on posting this and getting it uh, up onto the Google Classroom site and um, maybe even creating a YouTube uh, channel for us uh, that lets everybody look at this. So um, I'm going to sign off, and I'll probably make one more of these today where we talk about a pendulum, which is another a simple harmonic oscillator.